Let's thank you, Brian. That is commitment. <laughs> and a beautiful song. On your way to and from church this next week, you may notice something, may notice something, on the front lawn of our neighbors over at Gila Synagogue across the street. You may notice a small, simple hut constructed out of wood and decorated with a few different kinds of vegetation out in front of the synagogue. I checked in between services to see if it had been erected yet, and it had not. And I really hope that it will, or else I will have just not told the truth to you. <laughs> but that structure that I believe will be erected this week is known as a sukkah. Tonight begins the Jewish festival of Sukkot. Sukkot, also known as the festival of booths or the festival of tabernacles, is a fall harvest festival. And the simple wooden huts likely date back to a practice in agrarian society of constructing a temporary shelter out in the fields so that in the peak harvest season, you don't have to wait, waste valuable time traveling to the fields and back. You can wake up in the morning and go to work and work until you literally lie down in the evening for a bountiful harvest. Today, Jews observe the festival of Sukkot by constructing their own sukkahs outside their homes and they're eating meals or receiving visitors in these simple huts. The reason I mention all of this, the tie-in, is that this morning my sermon is about a particular biblical text, the book of Ecclesiastes. And the reason I'm preaching on this text today, of all possible days, is that Ecclesiastes is the scripture that is read as part of Sukkot. The connection between a harvest festival and the book of Ecclesiastes may at first flush not seem evident. Though after some reflection, it's possible to see that some of the prominent themes in Ecclesiastes, themes of time's passage, impermanence, change, and the inevitability of death, do have connections to the fall season and to the fields that lay fallow after the harvest. This morning, what I'd like to do is introduce to you the book of Ecclesiastes, Explore some of its spiritual and philosophical themes. Explore some of its challenging ideas. And then possibly relate it to some of the challenges we find in our living today. But fair warning, my sermon this morning, and Glenn gave me the terms for this, resembles an augmented or diminished chord, <laughs> which is to say it doesn't really resolve. As I began to write and study and look at this, I came to understand that there are some texts, some teachings, that I am absolutely 100% positive are good and worth our efforts to live by. And there are some texts that I'm sure are not good at all, and don't really, are not really worthy to live by. And then there are those texts that I am just not sure about, that challenge me and befuddle me, you may leave this morning concluding that the book of Ecclesiastes is like of great personal significance to you, or may not, and that is okay. And so this morning is really about inviting us into a kind of a wrestling space, an unsure space. It's okay if I preach an unsure sermon every once in a while. I find myself these days really kind of resonating with it. Okay, so the book of Ecclesiastes is one of the books of the Hebrew Bible, or what used to be known as the Old Testament. It belongs to a genre known as wisdom literature. That is, its primary concern is to impart to us wisdom about the nature of the world, the nature of the divine, and what it means to live a virtuous life. Before I go any further, I want to invite a little conversation here. I want to kind of know what you know about the book of Ecclesiastes. 
And so I'm going to look at a few questions. How many of you would say that you are deeply familiar and knowledgeable about this text? <laughs> That's one. When there was zero at the first service, Karen, awesome. How many of you would say that you are passingly or vaguely familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes? About a third of you. That's about the same as the first. And how many of you would say that you are completely unfamiliar or know next to nothing about the book of Ecclesiastes? About two thirds. And for those of you who know a little bit, what are, what are some of the things that you know about it? Is there anybody want to? All is vanity. Yeah, that's one of the first texts of it. Anything, anything else? A time for changes. A time for everything. Yes, it's in the beginning of chapter 3. There is a time for every purpose under heaven. There is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. So there's a lot of... Um, the, the title of all sorts of the... Um, the sun also rises. That title is a line from Ecclesiastes. So, a little bit of background. Ecclesiastes was written between 400 and 250 BC or BCE. It um, is an interesting text, and it is a Jewish text with a Greek title, and um, it probably represents some sort of conversation that is going on between um, Jewish thought and Greek philosophy. It is pseudepigraphy. Fancy word meaning that the author is pretending to be someone they're not. The author of the text claims the title of Kohelet, or the assembler, the teacher, the preacher. However, the author also claims to be King Solomon, the figure in the Bible most associated with wisdom. Although today, pretty much no credible scholar believes that Solomon actually wrote it. Ecclesiastes has been called on one hand, cynical, pessimistic, depressing, and even despairing. In fact, in um, a translation of the Bible that Eric read from, the text is introduced as the weirdest book of the Bible. <laughs> it's not uncommon for someone to read Ecclesiastes and remark that they are shocked that this is included in the Bible. And it seems that it isn't just modern readers who have concerns about it, it's widely believed among biblical scholars that in the process of forming the Hebrew Bible, editors went into the book of Ecclesiastes and added parts to make it less controversial and more pious. For example, there is a near consensus that the last five verses were tacked on many years later by a scribe. In the original text, it should end with the statement, All is utterly futile. But then, the five verses that were tacked on add this, but <laughs> we should still fear God and keep all of God's commandments, and that will prove worthwhile. So you can see that there is parts added to the text to try to, to, try to smooth it out a little bit. At the same time, as Ecclesiastes is problematic, it's also acclaimed as one of the most important and most beautiful works of literature in the entire Bible. Consider these words by the famous early 20th century novelist Thomas Wolfe. Thomas Wolfe also happens to be a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. He said, of all I have ever seen or learned, Ecclesiastes seems to me the noblest, the wisest, and the most powerful expression of human life upon this earth and also the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth. I am not given to dogmatic judgments in the matter of literary creation, but if I had to make one, I would say that Ecclesiastes is the greatest single piece of writing I've ever known, and the wisdom expressed in it is the most lasting and profound. How about that? You said a few people who said, oh, I'm going to go read that now. Ecclesiastes begins, like Lawrence said, with the author proclaiming the vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity may not be the best choice of words, depending on the translation. You find what Eric read, utter futility, all is futility. Emptiness, everything is empty. 
even meaninglessness. All is meaningless. But in Hebrew, the word that is used is hebel. Hebel is most often and most correctly translated as vapor or mist. In other words, this insubstantial substance, fleeting and ephemeral, that does not stick, it just floats and flows and dissipates. All is vapor. And to begin to get the flavor of this text, consider the second chapter of Ecclesiastes. Here, the author tells about a struggle to attempt to find meaning in life. The author begins in the second chapter by describing how he sought after pleasure, enjoyment, laughter, feasting, and drinking, but found it fleeting and ephemeral and futile and vain. He says, of laughter I said it is madness, and of pleasure, what's the good of that? He concludes that a life devoted to seeking pleasure is heaven, as fleeting as vapor. Next, the author claims to have sought out meaning in work and accomplishment and success and wealth. The author says, I undertook great works, I built myself palaces and planted vineyards, I made myself gardens and orchards and planted with every kind of fruit tree. I amassed silver and gold, the treasure of kings and provinces. I did not refuse my eyes anything they coveted, I did not design myself any pleasure. However, this too left him feeling unfulfilled. He says, considering my handiwork, all my labor and toil, it was futile, all of it, just a chasing after the wind and of no profit under the sun. All the work he ever did and all he ever accomplished, he says, is heaven, vapor. And then finally, the author describes how he went in search of wisdom, learning, philosophy, spirituality. He sought to become wise, but this did not lead him toward fulfillment. Upon gaining in wisdom, he finds, quote, I came to hate life, since everything that was done here under the sun was a trouble to me, for all is futility and the chasing of the wind. Even wisdom is heaven, is favor. You can see how this book gets its reputation, right? <laughs> and Kirsten, this is pretty harsh preaching. Sit with that for a second. Does anybody find that un make them uneasy? Or does anybody find that it makes them relieved? You wouldn't want me to step into the role of Kohelet. It wouldn't sound good if I were to say to you, everything that brings you joy and pleasure is fleeting. Your hobbies are like fog. Your joys will burn away before noon. Your art, your writing, your music, your service, your friendships, vapor. Everything you've worked for in your life is futile. Career and research and business, it all amounts to a light dew on the morning grass and your beliefs and convictions and the meaning you make and the philosophies that sustain you and spiritual practices, those are just the light haze. I wouldn't have a job if I said all that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I, I, I think about how I feel if I turn that on myself. See, my ministry, my career, my education, my hobbies, all that I hold sacred, the convictions that animate me, like a cloud dissipating in the sky. Some of you may not know this, but I, I, wrote, um, I wrote a book, edited a book with uh, Skinner House Books at the UUA some years back. And then like two years later, I go and, and click on the website and it says, out of print. <laughs> and, and I had that feeling like, oh yes, all is, all is vapor, right? It's, <laughs> Like two years and it's already it's already dissolved. It's already dissolving. <laughs> but that was that, that feeling. Oh. That's not the only thing that's troubling in this text. Have you ever stopped and listened to the words to the song Turn, Turn, Turn? I think a lot of the 
couplets we find wise and reassuring. A time to sow and a time to reap. We know that. A time to laugh and a time to cry. That's, that's true. A time to mourn and a time to dance. And that's true too. A time to bo be born and a time to die. Even though we, we may struggle with that one, we know that it's true. We know that's a true cycle. But what about some of those other couplets? How do we feel about a time for war and a time for peace? How do we feel about a time to kill and a time to heal? How do we feel about a time to love and a time to hate? What I like about this text is how challenging and discomforting it is. I sit there and I wrestle with it. When exactly is that time? So what's the meaning? By the way, on that, on that turn, 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 I'm told a, a story um, of, a, of a young child who hears it for the first time and says, why are we singing that song? That's not a nice song. Really? Yeah. There's some perhaps truth to that. So what meaning should we take from Ecclesiastes today? There are a pair of refrains in the text that I find meaningful. And one of them, which we explored earlier and what Lawrence shouted out, is vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Futility, all is utterly futile. That's one refrain that keeps coming up through the text. But then there is a second refrain that appears and reappears over and over in the text, and it goes like this. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. And I think that the text also encourages us to hold those truths. Futility all is futile, and there is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. And can we hold both of those at once? One of the popular readings of Ecclesiastes is to read it as kind of an existential text. And I think of the existentialist novel, The Plague, by Albert Camus. In The Plague, an Algerian city of Oran is struck by an outbreak of plague, and we see different responses from the different people in the city in facing this crisis. The protagonist, the hero, is Dr. Ryu. He is the hero of the text, and what he does that is heroic, his heroic response to this tragic circumstance is that he continues to be a doctor. He understands that his work is to relieve human suffering, and that's what he puts his head down and continues to try to do. Not because he's terribly effective at it. In fact, most of his patients are doomed. Like, we're all doomed in the long run. But he finds meaning, even while surrounded by larger meaninglessness. He finds meaning in his passion and in his commitment. I'm a doctor. It's my job to relieve human suffering. There is human suffering before me, so I must attempt to treat it. I think Ecclesiastes would approve it. There are a couple of different ways that we can respond to this idea of heaven, vapor, vanity, futility. One way is to despair, to declare all meaningful, all is meaningless. One way is to fight against it, to try to prove Ecclesiastes wrong, to say no, what I have or make or do will endure. And then there is another way, which is that way of liberation, to make our choices based not on what is most lasting, but on what we find virtue in the here and now, in undertaking. After all, if King Solomon has the wisdom to question his legacy and his success and his wealth, then we have that ability too question, well, everything. 
Ecclesiastes clears the table in some ways. In some ways, what it is is what will be before. But in some ways, there is this liberation, enormous liberation that we might find in the text. And so as you leave today, what is it that is fleeting? What is it that time is changing and modifying that you struggle with? What is it that you feel called to do? For no other reason than that it is what you are called to do. How do these texts and reflections merge and stitch with the place where you are in your life? I end as I promised, not with any conclusion. Go forth and do as Ecclesiastes says. Or go forth and don't listen to it. Go forth and trust him. And with that, I'm going to invite us to uh, sing on our closing hymn of the morning. Turn, turn, turn. And now don't, like I said before, don't go into it and just say, oh, there's a line that I disagree with. I'm not going to sing that line. I want you to feel that line, whether it's true to you or troubling to you. I want you to really feel it while you sing it. So please rise and body your spirit and let us sing it together.